Hi all, my name is Trey Ventor and I'm a UK based, UK Midlands based writer and race slash black history educator and practitioner. I also do work as a spoken word artist as well. All the references for this talk and further references can be found in the description via the link to a Padlet document. You will also find a link in that document to my bio should you wish to get in contact. Welcome to this session, which is called 22 Yards of Whiteness, You Don't Have to Be Posh to Be Privileged, where I'll be plotting my own relationship to whiteness um, via cricket, colonialism and private schools in this overarching global system of white supremacy. This comes off the back of an essay I wrote of the same name for my master's degree, which, is, which was Race, Education and Decolonial Thought for my module, um, for the module in critical whiteness studies. The module itself has reached, really changed my relationship to the work I do in my community, not in terms, not only in terms of the sessions like this one, but also in relation to my creative writing as my undergraduate degree was in creative writing. And I also do work as a writer. Whilst I do a lot of writing and, um, and I'm also a spoken word artist, I run sessions, sessions like this for companies and institutions, community groups, etc, etc. Before we begin, I'm going to do an introduction to another project um, that people may be interested in. Presently, I'm also in the process of curating a book on Northamptonshire's Windrush generation with my friend and colleague Shireen Ingram who runs Northampton-based charity Northampton. We're conducting interviews with the Windrush generation in our community based in Northamptonshire. So if you, really, if you know anybody that would be, want to be involved either as a project participant, as an interviewee, or simply wants experience working on a project like this, do let me know. Since February 2021, Volunteers at Northampton have been going door to door, delivering hampers to members of the Windrush generation. Lockdown has been bad for everyone, but we have seen peaks of loneliness and mental health issues for members of the Northamptonshire, Northampton Windrush generation. Having been cut off from physical community spaces that they hold most dear. This has also gone on to combat food poverty as some have not been able to get to the shops as they would have prior to the outbreak of the coronavirus. Ultimately, this is filling in a labour shortage that should have been filled by the local authority bodies. The Windrush doorstep befriending team acted as a lifeline, though reliant on the goodwill of volunteers delivering a service that should have been filled by the local authorities. With Hampers products sourced from local black and independent businesses, it gave some respite to the people that have often been responsible for helping and economically supporting relatives in the Caribbean as well. My time at Northampton, Northampton resulted in an article on the Windrush scandal reflecting on some of the links I have made between the Windrush scandal and the history of anti-black racism in the UK and the, and the former colonies as well. Ultimately, arguing that the critiques of by the national press did not go far enough in showing the longevity of this history which goes back centuries. In the theme of this session, the Windrush scandal is of course an act of institutional racism but further plays into white supremacy. This project has also seen us in contact with a publisher that has shown interest in publishing an edited anthology on Windrush Northamptonshire, each chapter we hope being written by a different person on some aspect of the Windrush in our home county, either now or in the past. We have had, number, we have a, we've had a number of students, such graduates from the university, put themselves forward as writers and researchers, so this is very exciting indeed. Okay, let's begin with terms, key terms of reference. So, etymology to begin with, I think I mentioned it a couple of times in the session, which basically is referring to the origin slash study of words, ethnography being the study of culture, privilege relating to the unmerited social advantages. And that term is wide reaching from, from me um, talking now 
are talking here now and existing in society, made, in a society made for the benefit of men, I have a privilege as a man. Other examples of privilege may include um, straight, heterosexual, neurotypical, cisgender, white, slim, able-bodied and others. Colonialism, referring to the seizure of resources, brutalization of indigenous cultures, embedding Western knowledge into the global society, linked to imperial policies to control others and other, and nation, other nations as well. Global North or slash global, global South is what on my masters we use instead of, instead of developed or underdeveloped nations. In using the latter, you then have to think why such nations are referred to as developed or underdeveloped. And when you trace it, we revisit the sad history of colonial exploitation. I think most of us will have run into that term whiteness before. So in this session, it is referring to all things relating to what Kalpana, Kalpana Sashadvi Crooks calls the master signifier. This is a definition, I like, this is a definition, not the definition, there are many definitions um, of whiteness. And I like to, this is the one I like to refer to in defining it, where she writes the inaugural signifier of race, which I term whiteness, implicates us all in a logic of difference. By whiteness, I refer to a master signifier without a signified that establishes a structure of relations, a signifying chain that, that through a process of inclusions and exclusions constitutes a pattern for organizing human difference. This chain provides subjects with certain symbolic position, positions such as black, white, Asian, etc., etc., in relation to the master signifier. And that is from her book, Desiring Whiteness, which can be found in the Padlet document. So my original essay, the essay brief, um, was an auto-ethnographic approach to whiteness, though I did not clock that at the time I wrote it, since I was not thinking in terms of this specific research method or any research method. I just wanted to write my essay as I, as I would write it. But the assignment, the assignment brief in itself did not use the term autoethnography outright. Autoethnography is a form of qualitative research that has previously been used by academics to understand how we, how we as people engage with the world. Or as Carolyn Ellis writes, autoethnography is an approach that seeks to describe and systematically analyze personal experience in order to understand cultural experience. As a spoken word artist, a writer, a journalist, and so on, lots of my work has followed social, social justice causes, as I do not write simply, really, for my own amusement. If writing is not political, or seeking to elevate those around us, or impact people's lives, or impact the well-being of our community, is there really any point in it? Following in the footsteps of others, autoethnography is a self-narrative that critiques the situatedness of self with others in a social context. Furthermore, Chang writes how autoethnography is a combination of cultural analysis and interpretation with narrative details. However, at its bones, I think I agree most with Ngunjuri, Hernandez and Chang in their assertion of autoethnography as a qualitative research method that utilizes data about the self and context to gain understanding of the connectivity between others, between self and others. I think how we as humans interpret meaning is subject to our exposure to culture and other countering positionalities. Our, le our levels of focus on the different axis, so the auto, the ethno, or the graphy, may depend on past experiences that, that have shaped, shaped us, including as Emma Emma Richard um, uh, writes, children or childhoods as becoming. And in research, our experiences and the external factors that mould us influence bias, both positively and negatively. Etymologically speaking, so in terms of word origin, um, via auto, the self, ethno, the cultural elements, or and graphy, the study process, 
we can see how human beings as social actors in society may be studied as individuals within culture. Some may focus on the self, some may get hyper-focused on traditional canons, so i.e. methodologies and theoretical approaches, and others may become fixated on the research process. However, in my experience, homing, homing in on the self has been met with scepticism in the university, argued as an illegitimate research practice, though many have argued in its defence. So not presented as traditional academia, British, and why I'm no longer talking to white people about race, by author journalists Afua Hirsch and Rennie Edo Lodge may be interpreted as examples of auto-ethnographic writing, both go into critical acclaim in 2017 and 2018. On the precipice of autoethnography, since the more well-known genre, autobiography, this is more of a first-person narrative of an individual story incorporating a study, so the study being the graphy of the self, which is the auto, with less focus on the cultural element, the ethno. The meaning of ethnography is the study of culture, or as communication scholar Carolyn Ellis writes, writing about or describing people and culture using first-hand observation and participation in a setting or situation. The term refers both to the culture of doing a study and to the written product. In the past, ethnography scholars have conducted research on, the cult on cultures outside of their lived experience in the image of Edward Said's Orientalism, spoken out of the depths of European culture by writers who actually believe themselves to be speaking on behalf of that culture. For example, regularly white scholars have conducted studies on the experiences of racially oppressed communities without an, without an analysis of their own whiteness in that space. In the context of speaking on behalf of, they enter that space with a psychological wage, as, written, as that term um, written by W.E.B. Du Bois in the 1930s, and how white institutions continue to purport white emotions. Author, journalist and critic Rennie Edo Lodge builds on the work of Du Bois, um, Noel, Noel Ignatin and Theodore Allen and Peggy McIntosh in writing, white privilege is an absence of the negative consequences of racism, disc structural discrimination, your race being viewed as a problem first and foremost. Less likely to, to succeed because of my race, she writes. While distance may be a step forward eliminate, in eliminating prejudicial biases, i.e. being removed from the subject matter at hand, the idea of being objective is unattainable when we all bring parts of ourselves to social settings, including belief systems. After all, no individual speaks apart from the societal frameworks of co-constructed meaning, basically saying we are all part of society and the influence of the society um, will, will, att will attach itself to us. Society um, constructs culture and we, we all bring parts of ourselves into every situation based on our own experiences of society and culture. Drawing from my earlier statement about factions of academia believing autoethnography to be an illegitimate research method, in conversation with my colleague, race equality specialist, Sophia Ackle, I found similar sentiments continue to exist in universities now in terms of qualitative research more generally. Talking about her research in, in relation to the study she did it on the experiences of um, students of colour at Goldsmiths, she told me you can learn you can learn so much about people from their oral histories or just sharing what's happening to them now. I used a mixture of both, uh, both methods, so the quantitative and the qualitative, because it speaks to different types of audiences, but also one backs up the other, if that makes sense. It's not about proving racism exists, 
it's not showing how in-depth it is. While Sophia discusses this from her positionality in higher education, I also witnessed similar sentiments during my time as a student and then as a student union sabbatical officer, with qualitative research methods presented as inferior to, qual to quantitative. Denzen and Lincoln state that the politics of people-focused research creates stresses that inform traditions of thought, including Marxism, feminism, and disability studies, with the tension itself constantly being re-examined and interrogated. In the meantime, battles between quantitative and qualitative camps continue. According to Carolyn Ellis, autoethnography encapsulates numbers of techniques including life histories and interviews. Following US President Jimmy Carter's crisis of confidence speech at the end of the 1970s, there was another crisis in the halls of academia. Researchers and academics deduced that research studies could be biased since they were done by human beings with the likelihood of human error as apparent, ushering a time where academic research was allowed to be personal. How about that? Psychiatrist Viktor Frankl said, each person's unique position relative to their disposition and situation means that he or she will perceive and represent internal and external phenomena only in particular ways. This of course means that no human being has access to universal truth. Criticisms from, from quantitative researchers against autoethnography auto are therefore null and void in my opinion where to be objective, one would need to be free from all the prejudice and emotions that make us human and alive. Whilst this autoethnography centers the self in historical and contemporary settings, my rationale comes from a biased perspective, its origins stemming from my own observations of the world. Whether my intentions are good or bad, I know these biases exist because I exist. So I thought I would give some info on what autoethnography is for those people that are not based in universities or in, or in um, higher education or in academia or researchers. All the references tonight or now will be made public. So don't worry if you miss stuff and you can easily just pause it and rewind and that sort of thing. So, though I'm not racialized as white, I've grown up in a part of the UK or Britain where it has been impossible to, to escape whiteness, Northamptonshire. Even though the University of Northampton, for example, where I did my undergraduate degree, has a high percentage of black and brown students, students of colour, Northamptonshire at large does not compare. Northampton is a town in the, basically in, relatively in the heart of England, which is, which is now relatively diverse. But it is still possible to walk, a, walk for hours without seeing another black person, especially when I was younger, when I was at private school, mainly in the West Northamptonshire countryside. I saw myself being racialized as black, but rarely did my white teachers or other white students talk about what it meant to be white. When we watch television, television, show, television shows, films, or read books, or even watch theater shows, as I do at my local theater, white people are still framed as the norm. In contrast to myself, mixed race, though racialized as black, as well as my Asian colleagues in the UK and elsewhere, further afield than First Nation people in Australia and the Americas, the Maui people in New Zealand and other groups racialized outside of whiteness. In essence, people not racialized as white are defined often entirely by their race or our race, while our cultural texts write whiteness as the norm Hence, right, hence writing anything else as not normal. Other people have a race, white people do not. Or as Sarah Ahmed writes, whiteness is only invisible to those who inhabit it. For those who don't, it's hard not to see whiteness. It even seems everywhere. So really, are we push, so rarely are we pushed to think about how whiteness structures our day-to-day -day lives if you are white. If you are not white, you really have to have some understanding of whiteness from birth to survive. The murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor last year, as well as others by US and non-US police officers, forced a step towards a conversation about racism in our society. But still, 
In that space, I did not see as much enthusiasm to face white supremacy, where documentaries and films released continue to put the onus on people of colour as victims of racism, not really naming white supremacy as the overarching system of control and violence and domination. For example, why are we talking about racism in football and not and not really um, the FA or FIFA as white supremacist institutions? Since white supremacy is introverted and not all about the KKK or colonial statues. I've seen documentaries by filmmakers like um, artist historians David Olasoga and filmmakers like Steve McQueen for the BBC since the murder of George Floyd last year. In addition to short films and standalones by Channel 4 that go as far as to challenge racism, but fall short of naming white supremacy as a socio-political system. In June 2020, I was contacted by, journalist, by a journalist at The Guardian called Lucy Campbell, and then interviewed by her colleague Amna Modin. I was thus part of a, of a Guardian article on Black Lives Matter after the murder of George Floyd. 50 people between the ages of 16 and 35-ish or so on Black Lives Matter, activists, educators, campaigners and the like. Afterwards, I had numbers of messages of support and solidarity on social media, including on my LinkedIn as well. I was then part of three more articles after that between uh, July 2020 and that December. However, in November, I was nominated for Northampton's Male Role Model of the Year um, for International Men's Day which I'm still not 100% not comfortable with as a, as a, as a thing. Really, really, the first time that had been done in Northampton. I then won that award by public vote for the work I had done in my community. Winning, it got me to think about the institution, institutions over the years that helped facilitate that. Having been a critic for my, on my local establishment for many years or for a, a while, I know I'm also acceptable, acceptable, I say that term in um, speech marks or air quotes, because of how I carry myself. Lots of those behaviours learned at private school. Would I have won that award had I not been privately educated? For most of my childhood, I attended schools where I was socialised to act in characteristically white middle class ways, also having to learn what we call received pronunciation or RP for short. Now I understand my education privileged me over my state educated peers. Since school was also a guidebook to understanding white institutions. Tonight I'll plot, well now I'll plot my relationship to global colonial whiteness in the context of my early induction to the private education sector, including the whiteness of cricket and my name as an attachment to the days of black enslaved people and white masters. So I was born Trey Ventor after my mum's family, but now I'm legally known as Trey Griffiths after my father's family. Yet most still know me by, the, by my birth name, derived from my reportedly francophone enslaved person owning ancestors, the latest of whom I found to be Benjamin and Rosiette Ventor in, in, in Grand Roy in the parish of St. George's in Grenada at the point of the compensation payout in 1833-34, as put by the legacies of British slavery by UCL London. That is the payout that was paid by the British government to the slave owners, not to the enslaved, and that the British taxpayer only finished paying off in 2015. In the pictures here, you will see part of where my grandfather grew up um, in, in St. George's before he came to England as a 16 year old boy, as part of the Windrush generation. I've only sh shown the houses, but behind the houses, there was bushland and grass and, and a, a vegetated area and the like. But my grandfather's house, so that was, that's great grandma Sita's house, is, that's where he was born. And this was in close proximity uh, to his other relatives. And on that land, there are graves to Ventor and Charles' ancestors. 
It brings me to think that maybe this is the site Benjamin Ventil may have lived, or at least nearby. My grandfather too, as I said, was born, was born there. So I wonder if this area is near to the plantation part of my family's roots grew from. In Grenada, I'm also related to the Noels, the Moors, and the Wellingtons. What that signify is white terror in the erasure of our African names, White, uh, wh where whiteness was a tool of racist colonial oppression and associated with the terrible, the terrifying, the, terrifi the terrifying, the terrorizing white people as terrorists, especially those who dared to enter the segregated space of blackness as written by bell hooks in black looks, race and representation. The presence of Master Ventor is akin to what Bell Hooks discusses simply in the context of the slave polity in the West Indies, the incursion of a white plantocrat in black spaces. And the Ventors were not by any means prominent slave owners, simply bit plays in a wider system of white supremacy. However, my name is part of my whiteness, as it is not a name I got to choose. A reminder through violence of my privilege as someone that carries a European name where there, there is an unconscious or really a really very conscious bias against so-called ethnic names in applying for jobs in the global north. This denotes a long relationship and historical continuity with both me and my family and also that also enslavement in global colonial whiteness as white European slave names signify old colonial attachments as black rights activists, activist Malcolm X wrote in 1968, my ex replaced the white slave master's name, which some blue-eyed devil named Little had imposed upon my, upon my paternal forebears. In thinking about this, it brings me back to Sarah Ahmed and her essay, Declarations of Whiteness, where she laments about histories of racism as histories of the present, whilst Portia poet Portia Aliwola says that racial traumas and triggers are a formal greeting when we call our precious name to introduce ourselves. When our names are a historical leash, every time I meet a black person with the last name Beatty, I wonder if we are finally attending the family reunion. Meanwhile, psychologist and scholar Ghislaine Kanani writes, too often black people are told that, they, that we must keep quiet when we experience racial injustices. That is, if these experiences are even recognized as injustices. After the murder of George Floyd, it was sad to see police violence wasn't the only trigger or trauma in play. When Bristol's statue of Edward Colston was pulled down, it reminded me there are few places in this country, or really any country, in Western Europe or the Americas I can visit without being triggered by motifs to Europe's colonial, colonial past. In the UK, this includes London, Liverpool, and Edinburgh, and Oxford. And as I found out more viscerally in, in July 2021, Lancaster as well. To see streets and monuments named for racists, as, as well as colonial statues littered around this country. Here I see white terror wherever I go, with white terror plastered around the country I call home. In this history, we can see how the white institution of enslavement sits upon the identities of black British people today of Caribbean heritage, where our names are not divorced from the overhang of this colonial system of domination. So talking about America, Dr. Joy DeGroy discusses post-traumatic slave syndrome. It's an explanatory theory that looks at multi-generational trauma, talking about people being captured, shipped, sold, beaten, raped, experimented on. In Britain, this trauma continued after enslavement with white violence, Pertinently after the First World War with the 1919 race riots, where not only were black people victims of white terror by civilians, but also from the police as well, harassment around the country, including London, Liverpool, Cardiff, 
Salford, Glasgow and across Tyneside. I know members of my own family have been victims of, pol of police violence when they were children in Northamptonshire in the 1980s and I know what enabled that was the same whiteness that saw children of the Windrush as, threat, as a threat to white superiority in the Windrush scandal. The colonisation of the Caribbean and the African continent just happened to be the starting point. At school, I did not think of my name being called in the cricket register with the same implications I do today. Going to Great Houghton Prep in 2004, being a black boy walking out onto the field in white, surrounded by white boys in white, had a wider meaning. But as a descendant of black people or black enslaved people, I played a sport that was used to civilise us by the white institution of empire. Today, I now see I was essentially coerced or manipulated to behave in characteristically white ways in what scholar Tom Nicholas articulates as part of Charles Mills's Six Dimensions of White Supremacy, highlighting the prioritisation of white ways of thinking and acting. Black people are forced to adopt white ways of thinking and behaving if they are to succeed in the world. The fact I entered this system as someone that was both black and working class may also show that I had to learn those codes. And as Professor Cowan by Powell writes, as based on the perception of conforming to society's expectations, in which other hierarchies, based on language, dress, education and taste, distinguish one group from another. And even then, I was of no distinguished family name what did I have to offer these people? I do not share the same educational frames of references as most black people in my circles today. Since most I now call friends were educated in the state system, private school has connotations of wealth and privilege, dare I say aristocracy. And despite going to smaller schools, I must acknowledge that these places are the difference between have and have not and are entangled in global colonial whiteness. This produced my own difficult relationship between with race and social class. Whilst I was not the only child from a working class background here, I was the only black working class child. However, this did not stop members of the upper classes from looking down their noses at my working class roots. George Orwell writes in The Road to the Wigan Pier, um, about the lower class smell. Now, the upper classes were taught to hate the working classes for no feeling of like or, or of like or dislike is quite so fundament, fundamental as a physical feeling. It may not greatly matter if the average middle class person is brought up to believe that the working class are ignorant, lazy, drunken, boorish and dishonest is when he is brought up to believe that they are dirty, that the harm is done. And in my childhood, we were brought up to believe that they were dirty. Very early in life, you acquired the idea that there was something subtly repulsive about a working class body. You would not get any nearer to it than you could help. Here, George Orwell um, introduces us to notions of disgust. I record these distinctions of dirtiness between the white middle classes and the white working classes at school. At GHPS, so Great Houghton Prep School, their middle classes hailed from local Northamptonshire villages. And whilst the white working class were from Northampton, in disparities of class, there was a further distinction between the urban and rural living, where white acted as a stand-in for country, and non-white or not white enough was, as a, was acted as a, a symbolic for the town or the city. Furthermore, the disgust for the working class are synonymous for the dirt or inferiority of the town. Thus, some people are whiter than others, some are not white enough, and many are inescapably cast beneath the shadow of whiteness, writes Anup Nayak. Here I began to see how whiteness differentiates itself amongst groups read as white. However, these hierarchies were also reproduced by black Britons in my vicinity who did not like the idea of my private education. 
to them, this was synonymous with my parents and I becoming too white, too highbrow. My mum and dad seemingly had too much ambition and hubris for me and themselves in a world where I think we need to normalise, as Ahmed Ali says, not equating blackness to poverty and struggle. With criticisms of the private sector having increased in the last few years, I am now unsurprised that people close to my parents acted with the hostility they did towards my education. To them, I'd become white, where whiteness was a surrogate for middle class. My formative years enveloped me, enveloped me in a middle class identity, and I think my parents thought this might cushion me from the violent racism of the mainstream state education system they experienced. They were wrong. Yet in the private sector, we must come to see how institutions would mould thought and how some black people that pass through these sorts of institutions slash interact with others that pass through them can then act in harmful ways, reproducing the whiteness of these places, i.e. black conservative MPs. Uh, this is a tweet from psych um, psychologist Ghislaine Kanani, who I mentioned earlier at the beginning. Uh, so black conservative MPs uh, at the Labour 2020 Black History Month debate. Here, one could argue school reared me to embody and reproduce the same class behaviours uh, that, that Shannon Sullivan writes about in relation to race and class social etiquettes. And Ghislaine Kanani's comment here is referring to the rant by the Women and Equalities Minister um, Kemi Badenoch against critical race theory and white privilege at last year's debate in the House of Commons. Shannon Sullivan writes, as long as both white master and black and slave observed the appropriate rules of address and gestural codes of behavior, etiquette is a code that binds the, both the dominant and the subordinate. After all, then significant social distances could be maintained in the midst of intimate proximities, intimate physical proximities. What the example of racial etiquette from antebellum America shows is that far more than physical separation, white Southerners wanted social distance. I'm going to go on a tangent for a little minute, um, just to give an example of how whiteness can appear with black and brown faces. So the 2021 Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities, aka the Sewell Report, is a good example of how, of how whiteness can appear with a black or brown face. However, it was biased from the start, with both Tony Sewell and Munira Mirza having built names for themselves, questioning the very existence of institutional racism, fronted with black and brown people as the diversity bunting, as Ash Sakar puts it, the findings of the report found there was no evidence of institutional racism in the UK. What Birmingham City University professor, Professor Kehinde Andrews called government-led gaslighting. The very liberal politics of positive representation in our institutions, especially in education, so students can see themselves represented. Whilst I agree with it in concept, it acts on the premise that everybody that shares similar identity markers will organize in, the, in your interest, essentially. The idea is deeply flawed when the most diverse cabinet in the history of the Conservative Party continues to uphold institutional racism with Priti Patel's anti-protest bill to curb Black Lives Matter protesters, as well as protesters at large. In addition, um, um, Kemi Badenoch, as I mentioned earlier, um, the Equalities Minister, does not think the curriculum is colonised and, up, and upholds the Conservative Party's ideals that keep the curriculum white. In Patel and Badenoch, we see how the faces of white supremacy can reflect the so-called multicultural image of the Britain we see today. The nation we keep boasting about, as well as other, as well as other black and brown Tory MPs as well. More representation sounds good in concept, but in doing this, we must explore people as individuals and not continue with the assumption that all women, for example, are for liberation of women, 
that all black people are, for, are pro Black Lives Matter. We must see how just doing diversity is not enough. When we want to do diversity in our institutions, I want to know what their politics are before they before they come in, so we don't get more pretty patels and coming bathing locks in our in, in our institutions acting violently whilst also presenting the image of diversity at the same time, so to speak. In anti-racism and girl boss representation politics, you'll see how people from oppressed groups um, can work against the interests of those groups. So not everyone that looks like us or you will think like us or you, or as Nora Zeal Hurston puts it back in the 1920s or 30s, I think, not all my skin folk are my kin folk. Cressa de Dick, the former chief of London Metropolitan Police, denied the existence of institutional racism in the police service. Accessing high spaces is not the be all and end all because when it has happened, it has not always ended well. Is she good for women's issues or movements? Is she good for anti racism? I would not say so. What about Margaret Thatcher, a grocer's daughter who went on to strike a nail through the working class? Elon Musk in the context of uh, the autistic communities or autistic communities. Trevor Phillips, Calvin Robinson in the relation to anti-racism and black communities across Britain. I don't think so. So we need to learn that just because someone shares some of your identity attributes, i.e. your class, race, sexuality, gender, disability and so on, that does not mean they will organise in your interests or even stand with you in solidarity. Nobody is more interested in discourses on identity than black and brown people that vote conservative or even are Tory MPs themselves, because they will tell you how their parents or even grandparents left former colonies of empire with nothing but the clothes on their back, was at the same time deporting your parents and my grandparents back to countries they have not seen since they were children. The Prime Minister is using them as a cover for the ongoing institutional racism perpetuated by his party and people are too scared to question it out of fear of being labelled a racist. So there is more fear of being labelled a racist than there is for the racism itself. So there we have a government that hates people discussing racism using black and brown faces to show us that supposedly it does not exist. It uses these people black and brown faces in white spaces to tell us that it does not exist. This report was constructed by black and brown people that do not believe institutional racism exists and they came to a conclusion that fitted the government's already established hypothesis or agenda. Gaslighting the nation whilst concurrently upholding the status quo, thus white supremacy, whiteness is so successful and its invisibility. I would recommend to pause the video here and take a break and go back over anything you didn't understand or want to revisit. Um, if not, I'm going to I'm going to carry on now anyway. However, when we look back historically, we can see examples in countries like China, India, Botswana, and Kenya where small minorities of colonized people, oppressed people were given special privileges to reproduce whiteness and that system of domination acting as a nexus between oppressor and oppressed. Back in 2020, after the Black History Month debate, we saw Women's and Equalities Minister Kemi Badenoch ranting about critical race theory and how, and how, teachers, and how teachers shouldn't be teaching white privilege in schools as a fact or as broadcast journalist Afua Hirsch tweeted, imperial systems have always, been, have always relied on the complicity of a small number of colonized people invested in the status quo. Applies to the mental colonization of today's black Tories as much as the literal co-option of black elites in the empire. Nothing new by design, but triggering AF. At GHPS, I was forced to lose my Northamptonian accent and speak NRP, receive pronunciation. I was coached to eat properly with one teacher telling me not to shovel food onto my fork like I was a commoner. <laughs>
I was taught to eat in the codes acceptable to the middle classes in a way that dictated white standards of professionalism. These were the halls, hallways of children with old school ties, boys raised to be gentlemen, aspiring to the great and the good. Mostly this meant using working class bodies as cannon fodder. It meant rugby in autumn and cricket in summer. Whilst at school, I was conditioned to act in white middle class ways of speaking. At home, my etiquettes struggled to revert back to their default Northamptonian accents and really eating how I wanted. My inability to code switch between the, these behaviours of both classes was the difference between some behaviours being aligned to white and others being tied to non-white slash not white enough. Since as Ruth Frankenberg states, often what was criticised as white was as much the product of a white of a middle class state of whiteness as such. Stephanie Lawler describes how working class productivity is produced in opposition to the low, and the low cannot do anything but repulse them, the middle classes, bound up with the middle class identity. But even though I inhabited middle class behaviours, the institution was clearly disgusted, discussed that I that a, work, that a working class body existed in its presence. Whilst at home, there was a disgust because I had learned codified white middle class ways of being. And this disgust was often unknowingly cushioned by the discomfort of laughter. Within the private system, the presiding ideology was village since indoctrination into England's pleasant land started early. We played cricket and sang hymns to the melodies of I vow to thee my country and shine Jesus shine. Students were acculturated into an Englishness that promoted a cultural superiority under global colonial whiteness in its obsessions with cricket and the class etiquettes of afternoon tea, etc, etc. The white liberal politics of politeness was not creating a fuss. It was keep calm and carry on. An institution that was happy to advertise brown bodies after diversity. And as Sarah Ahmed writes, diversity often creates a happy impression. It's how an organisation appears welcoming to those who appear different by drawing on those who appear different. Our bodies were used to promote multiculturalism, to make the school feel good about its charitable deeds. And as Peter Olasoga states, white saviours refer to white people helping people of colour, being lauded for their efforts, and usually learning something valuable about themselves in the process. Whilst in the present day, concepts of white saviourism are donned on white people doing charity work abroad in black and brown countries, my early education showed this to me in cricket, where until 1960, a white man would always be captain of the West Indies cricket team. However, cricket was one of the few elements of this green and pleasant land that I liked, but it's not hard to see the similarities between white educators teaching me how to play and the civilising mission of slave owners, showing me as a black boy a sport that was used to subjugate my forebears. Here we will visit old histories portraying um, the image of, of, of the benevolent planter, the paternal planter invested in Christianizing and so-called civilizing the enslaved, as said by Dr. Kate Donington in Britain's Forgotten Slave Owners. Where matches were a chance for the school to showcase me to rivals, similar to how David Olasoga describes, describes Victorian perceptions of the African princess, Sarah Forbes Bonetta. David Olasoga states that in the eyes of some people, Sarah's life was to become a social experiment and a rather patronising one. This clearly bright child was used to demonstrate that under British guidance, an African could become educated, Christianised, and in the buzz term of the 19th century, civilised. During enslavement, black people were depicted as childlike, brutal, savage and uncivilised that needed the, gu needed the guiding white hand and the discipline of the plantocracy. In my case, school, Great Houghton, was that slave plantation and the guiding white hand of my teachers intended to keep me disciplined under whiteness as the ultimate controlling impulse. 
cricket was a spectacle that had became ever more so when I attended Wellingborough School in the Michaelmas term, so the autumn of 2009. By the Trinity term, the summer, my white peers were shocked. I knew cricket so well, and my rejection of their help was met with their rejection of my working class body. Audre Lorde argued that institutionalised rejection of difference is an absolute necessity in a profit economy. We have all been programmed to handle that difference in one of three ways. Ignore it, and if that's not possible, copy it, and if we think it is dominant, if we think it is dominant, or destroy it, if we think it is subordinate. These white children exploited any sign of perceived difference, including my inferiority based on race and class. On the cricket field, they tried to destroy me. Built in the late 16th century, this is a school in one of the most socioeconomically deprived parts of Northamptonshire. A private school in this area is a constant reminder to the, to the local poor whites of their powerlessness, since as Richard Dyer writes, to be white is to have expunged all dirt, fecal, otherwise for oneself. To look white is to look clean. My colleagues sneered at their state neighbours, like poor white students, doing so with glee, and as author George Orwell reiterates, we were brought up to believe that the working class were dirty. Early, you acquired the idea that there was something subtly repulsive about a working class body. You would not get nearer to it than you could help. Observing cricket, I saw how the, saw that white girls were there to support the boys from the sidelines since matches were often a whole school event. Ruth Frankenberg argues the role of white girls, thus women, to be pure and passive, obeying the supporting the whims of the ideal white boys or men. During netball and hockey matches, support from boys and men was not always reciprocated. Sports represented a hierarchy, showing white girls were not treated as well as the boys. However, girls' behaviour was policed by all teachers, where behaviours like fighting and aggression, i.e. in hockey matches, were considered unladylike. Harking back to the sort of policing that happened during anti-suffrage movements at the start of the 20th century. School showed me that white girls were there to maintain the image of England as a white nation fantasy, implying the spatial dimensions of nationalist practices with cricket as a macro material practice. In both the activity of play and spectatorship, whiteness both differentiates itself, showing a gendered and race practice, including placing British South Asian girls on the edge of the picture frame of cricket in England's pastoral countryside. And here it is worth noting, while many of my colleagues were white girls experiencing misogyny, they still owned their white privilege. And in both misogyny and racism, blame will always be blame will always be placed on those that complain. To paraphrase Sarah Ahmed, in naming the problem, you become the problem, and the institution will always protect itself in the so-called neutrality of that hetero patriarchal whiteness. W.E.B. Du Bois wrote the white group of labourers, while they received a low wage, were compensated by a sort of psychological wage. They were given public deference and titles of courtesy because they were white. That whilst Du Bois is talking about the American white working class, this may also apply to the role of white middle class people or girls at school, who saw people like themselves in their teachers that had access to power and preferential treatment. In the 1960s, Theodore Allen and Noel Eglinton began to speak of what they called white skin privileges. That whilst they saw whiteness comes with benefits that allowed white working class people to see themselves as separate from the rest of their class, school also showed me that the white skin privileges of white middle class people also um, allows them to see what themselves as separate from their class. So this may show how whiteness splits and not just how it discriminates in accordance with middle class ideas of disgust against the working class, but also on the grounds of blackness and brownness as a racial descriptor in the middle upper classes.
School gave me the cultural frames to navigate white institutions, including universities, with addiction to challenge the white middle classes. School came with benefits. However, actor David Harewood found in his documentary, Will Britain Ever Have a Black Prime Minister, that white children are four times more likely to live in wealthy, wealthy households than black children. These are the children I was educated with, and it's now showing me that in growing up in close proximity to whiteness, I then had a more seamless university experience than most of my peers, peers that were both white and black. Yet my parents' choice to send me to private school was as damaging as it was fruitful. Whilst it gave me the tools to navigate white institutions, school invested in a perilous civilizing mission, which was also one of whitening as a class behavior. From the mastery of cricket to my so-called Christianization in hymn singing and Thursday chapel services in the pallor of privilege. In retrospect, albeit not going to the big private schools like Eton or St Paul's, I have still benefited from a system that privileges the wealthy over the non-wealthy. However, that also looked like whiteness as a constructed idea of professionalism in behavioural social etiquettes. Here, whiteness continues to exist as a cultural power, which does not ignore the boundaries of race by letting me in but disproportionately discriminates on racial grounds, because in the UK, a person is more likely to be poor if they're not racialized as white British. And whilst my schools were bit players in the private sector, it gave me a link to that world in an Englishness of afternoon tea, cricket, capes, gowns, and scrum caps, more Downton Abbey, and the railway children than Dan Hyde Park Corner. Author and broadcaster Afwa Hirsch argues the question, where are you from, is reserved for people that differ to the white norm and are asked for an explanation every single day, often multiple times. Where the implicit nature of this question is whiteness as interchangeable with English or British. Passing through these red brick institutions, you'd think my Englishness would not be as contested as it is. However, going to fee paying schools, this question was framed differently in the sense that black and brown people were encouraged to socially distance themselves from rural ideas of Englishness in the country. The scholars Darren Chetty and Karen Sands O'Connor write, Locking BAME characters into urban settings also means certain kinds of plots, certain kinds of Britishness are denied them. Since, since many of the classic or canonical 20th century stories depend on the British countryside landscape to provide freedom and ultimately safe adventures for white child characters and readers, the countryside in British children's stories or books is a green and pleasant land indeed, but only if you are white, or accompanied by someone white. Whilst the, this quote is in the context of English literature, their statements can also be applied to how we think about Britishness in social settings in reality. Here, I think Britain is still often thought of as a white nation fantasy, to uh, paraphrase um, Gasson Hodge, his title from his book, White Nations, depicted as the invisible master signifier uh, such as Crooks, where historically whiteness was not simply a descriptor, it was used to give anchor to the idea Europe was a place of modernity and civilization. In particular, white upper class men were thought inherently modern and sophisticated, their black and brown counterparts, the opposite, writes Maya Goodfellow in, in her book Hostile Environment. At school, I was forced to emulate ideals of these white upper class men. No matter my class, my heritage was questioned. Where are you from, they'd ask. Northampton, I respond. No, really, where are you really from? To inhabit a brown body is to be other, where whiteness is allowed to differentiate itself. Actor and poet 
and performer Riz Ahmed says, I bend the words like Brown and West until they dispel what. And while school didn't treat nearby white working class state children as white, they still afforded them a British identity, where my black Britishness was always questioned. Despite all that, Great Hatton Prep also tried to save me through cricket as a civilising tool. Simultaneously, this concept, of cha- this concept of charity to minorities was applied to white groups overseas, like the yearly shoebox donations to poor children in Romania. Here, they applied a similar practice to the white saviorism of the white saviorism concurrently applied to me, to children in Eastern Europe. Brittany Aronson argues that in the system of white supremacy, we are falsely taught that being white is better, so it makes sense why we would instill our white values upon students of colour. But in GHPS's charitable deeds, did the institution see Romanians as white or not white enough? These boxes mainly contained hygiene products, a signifier that clean that the clean English middle classes were trying to save the un- so-called unclean or dirty working classes at a distance, where othering happened on the grounds of culture, geography, and class. Shannon Sullivan further writes that class differences within the group of white people make meaningful difference to their race, and this is a constitutive, not an additive difference. Class differences aren't lumped on top of homogenous whiteness. They instead constitute whiteness differently for poor and middle-class white people. In creating a shoebox gift for school, I, a black person, was doing whiteness. In the English context, Romanians were not white enough. During the EU in 2007, Romania became an A2 nation and then and thus aligned itself with dominant whiteness. They were awarded with a symbolic or a cultural whitening. Similar to what happened to the Jews, the Polish and Irish people in the United States. In 2008, Romania was given access to the labour labor market, but unlike their A8 colleagues, Romania was allowed inside dominant whiteness, where A8 nations like Poland and Slovenia with communist histories were left on the periphery. These institutional mechanisms of politics tell us who is slash isn't institutionally seen as white. And with that comes certain privileges. However, this did not translate to Great Houghton's approach to charity. Although Romania had EU status, how they were thought of by individuals did not change with the continued othering of their cultural differences and connotations of disgust. The same disgust I see in how they are still treated in my vicinity and the material practice of their political A2 status did not necessarily stop daily racism. Through the shoebox appeal, my teachers tried to show us British values of tolerance, except rather than work with local charities that had links to Romanians in Britain, they exported that charity and goodwill overseas and did their best to maintain that space, both socially and geographically. Whilst as an isolated incident, this is seemingly harmless, it mirrors old histories of Britain exporting its problems and goodwill and violence abroad and how in this how in the georgian period the establishment deported london's black poor to sierra leone on the african continent in my opinion to avoid dealing with britain's homelessness crisis of its black populations after the after the war for independence What these two concepts of charity have in common is whiteness as giving. In one sense, there is a village private school giving from a distance. And in the other, there is the British establishment sending London's black homeless population a distance and other black veterans as well to another continent under the guise of help.
quite literally in the in the British establishment's impulse to govern, to have power over life, the ultimate controlling impulse. So writes Shona Hunter. In both cases, there is a white savior complex and no want to empower these people or populations to help themselves. And this is in the same way as school projected onto me, to civilize me, where whiteness attached itself to cricket. When I played, they tried to force me to mimic the white boys. Looking back, I cannot help but compare my experiences to how white English cricket boards of the 70s and 80s treated the West Indies cricket team. The Caribbean's history entrenched in colonial violence is a story enveloped in global colonial whiteness where cricket was used as a colonizing tool since it was the sport of the British Empire. Today, the politics of cricket plays out on the field, especially when England play many of its former colonial territories. For me, this is a sport of empire where I was taught so-called British values, and in doing so, I picked up characteristic white middle-class etiquettes and behaviours in their efforts to civilise me as really a characteristically English gentleman. What I didn't know then, but what I do know now is that in taking part in the English game, I was reenacting old histories where after the emancipation of enslaved black people and enslaved mixed race people in the Caribbean, cricket became the new cultural institution by which England sought to socialize the population and reinforce hierarchies in its colonies, writes Carlton McClendon which was imported into its dominions through swathes of the British Empire. Ash Ashis Nandi writes that the 19th century was also the, pe was also the period when the various post-utilitarian theories of progress began to be applied to the new colonies. The emerging culture of cricket came in handy to those using these theories to hierarchize cultures, the, cu the cultures, fates and societies which are one by one coming under colonial domination. What I was also ignorant to at school is the fact my natural disposition to play cricket in fundamentally different ways to the white boys could be interpreted as resisting the weight of whiteness. As a descendant of black and mixed race colonised people in the West Indies, does this run in the blood? In Beyond the Boundary, Trinidadian historian C.L.R. James conflates the cultural value of cricket with Western art, canon, art canons, saying cutting, so the cut shot, is alike to the art of Michelangelo and Burke, where in the very centre of this was William Beldum and his cut. In short, he conveys the difficulty of the cut shot, comparing it to the work of white artists, a difficult play to make, and a gesture of mastery that serves little if any practical purpose. The fact I mastered the English game much better than many of the white boys was an affront to Englishness and an incursion to their whiteness, where cricket replaced enslavement to socialize the newly free black populations. In the 18th and 19th centuries, especially the 19th, Race science was drawn upon to justify the inferiority of people of black, black African descent, where Angela Sayini writes that race science became a pastime of non-scientists too. Arthur de Gobineau proposed there were three races where the Negro variety is the lowest and stands at the foot of the ladder. Whilst cricket is as much English history as it is Caribbean, the fact I mastered their game offended lots of the white boys, disrupting the social order. Where, as Emma de Berry writes, in the history of humankind, white people have only existed since 1661. The idea that different features, hair textures or complexions have any intrinsic value or meaning constitute racial, racial difference did not exist before then.
In sharing the past, Northamptonshire Black History Association tell us that between 1860 and 1865, the race course in Northampton was the home of Northamptonshire cricket. I have played cricket on the race course countless times over the years, and in doing that, I'm treading on old ground that generations of Black Britons did before me. The owners of that land, the freemen of Northampton Borough, had an ongoing kerfuffle with the cricketers. So in 1885, it moved to where it is today, Wantage Road. 1886 is the first year recorded, recorded for overseas visitors when the Parsis came from India to tour England, returning again in 1888. They were originally from um, what Northamptonshire Black History Association called right as Persia, which I think is modern day Iran, and became pioneers of the game in India. They visited Northamptonshire and played against Northamptonshire, Northamptonshire gentlemen. In August 1906, the West Indies toured England for the first time and played a three-day match in Northamptonshire, winning by 155 runs. LeBron Samuel Constantine was a member of that team. His son, Leary Nicholas, became Britain's first black peer. George Chalinor was also part of that team, the first West Indian to score 5,000 first-class runs. And also Percy Goodman, one of the early great West Indian batsmen, was part of that team. They visited on a number of occasions, including 1923, when they drew with Northamptonshire, and in, and in 1928, when, when, they, when they beat Northamptonshire by an innings, by an innings and 126 runs. So really, North, the county got a drumming. 1933 and 1966 resulted in Northamptonshire victories. Gary Sobers was a member of that West Indies team. And the local victory happened again in 1969. The team pictured right are the United Social Cricket United Social Club cricket team, part of Northamptonshire in the 70s and the 80s. In the book Sharing the Past, Marlene Codner says that this this team had been winning Northampton Town League for nearly 20, Northampton Towns League for nearly 20 years. In Northampton, cricket was an important part of the social life for Windrush migrants. Sharing the past also says that Northampton had a successful football team called the Persuaders, made up of many Caribbean migrants. So as we can see here, cricket did not get to the Caribbean and India by accident. It was forced upon them by colonizers and these so-called colonial subjects made the game their own. And in the context of, of United Social, they demolished everybody. They demolished the English at their own game. And really were a microcosm of the West Indies at the time, during the 1980s at least. Surrounded by white bodies, I was viewed as inferior, much to do with global colonial whiteness, where colonial views of black bodies had been passed down the classes, not just through laws, but also the normalization of what Bell Hooks writes as white people, as terrorists in the upper echelons of the British establishment, many of whom I went to school with, that my enjoyment of cricket came at the expense of some people viewing me as subhuman, with white people as the terrible, the terrifying, especially those who dared to enter the segregated space of blackness. Whether we are talking about the state of polity, or even, or even how schools today continue to enable racist bullying, in their reactions to it rather than preventing it. I used cricket as a vessel to interrupt the codified etiquettes of the English game by embodying a tradition of play developed by free black people after enslavement and further developed by the Windrush generation, including people like my grandfather, born a British subject in Grenada in 1943. I resisted whiteness. Steve Martineau believes that race st that st Steve Martineau uh, thinks that race states a system of social and political relationships where white people think of themselves in relation to those, out those outside of of dominant whiteness, because as Richard Dyer states, whites are not of a certain race; they are just the human race. As white people control our institutions in the global north, 
they get to decide that race as a concept is inseparable from the white hierarchical domination that constructs it. With cricket, the etiquettes attached were coded as English and, English, and Englishness was historically coded as white by colonizers, as put by Emma de Beery as well. With my entry into the private sector, my existence was in proximity to whiteness. Gavita Banner argues that diversity only exists if there's an assumed neutral point from which others are diverse. Putting aside for now the, that straight male middle-classness of that neutral space, its dominant aspect is whiteness. At school, my lack of whiteness as a racial descriptor superseded my class. In both school and cricket, I was a space invader, a black body out of place in white spaces, that whilst these spaces were not academia, they did centre white ways of seeing the world. In October 2020, I delivered a lecture at Stowe School on the history of the Black Lives Matter movement. Over a decade after leaving this culture of old school ties, I came back to it again with ease. And scarily, I adjusted. However, in doing this lecture, I now see how my whiteness attached itself to this culture like, like muscle memory. Although we discussed institutional racism and white supremacy, we did not talk about institutional whiteness and how in a school complicit in colonial violence and exploitation and global colonial whiteness through its links to enslavement, I could see the institutionalization of whiteness, including the centering of white emotions as the dominant. The McPherson report stated in, or defines institutional racism as the collective failure of an organization to provide an appropriate and professional service to people because of their color, culture or ethnic origin. It can be seen or detected in the processes, attitudes and behavior which amount to discriminate through unwitting prejudice, ignorance, thoughtless, thoughtless and racist stereotyping. Thoughtlessness and racist stereotyping which dis disadvantage minority ethnic people. The organization of white spaces suggests that this definition falls short of explaining institutional whiteness by seeing evidence of the collectivity of racism only in what institutions fail to do. In other words, the McPherson report defines institutional racism in such a way that racism is not seen as an ongoing series of actions that shapes institutions in the sense of the norms that get reproduced or posited over time. We might then wish to see racism as, as a form of doing or even a field of positive action rather than a form of inaction. For instance, we might wish to see or examine how institutions become white through the positioning of some bodies rather than others as the subjects of the institution. Who are the institution is shaped for and who it is shaped by. Racism would not be evident in what we fail to do, but what we what what we what we have already done, whereby the we, the institution itself, is an effect of the doing. The recognition of the institutional racism in the McPherson report reproduces the whiteness of institutions by seeing racism simply as the failure to provide for non white others because of a difference that is somehow theirs." End quote. And I've just read from the slides there on those two screenshots from White Spaces. So I believe that in saying, I believe that in saying that as a black person, I went to private school, saying I was a victim of institutional racism does not go far enough. I was furthermore a victim of institutional whiteness because the repetition of these behaviours from these institutions brings me to think how, inst how these institutions in Britain are institutionally white in their, in, in, in their bodies, knowledges and ways of seeing the world they push forward over others that they don't. In the image of Audre Lorde's rejection of difference, 
either ignore it, copy it, or destroy it. And more often than not, it, it's, it's all three of those actually. Either ignore it, and then if, if it's too much, they destroy it, or copy it and appropriate, and that sort of thing. So, I tell anyone that if you want to understand whiteness, watch cricket. Better yet, go to your local club and watch their games because you will see the policing of difference. And that's how whiteness operates. Whether those bodies are racialized as black, Asian or white, the rejection of difference plays out, plays out at every level of the game, taking on the ethos of the impulse to govern, the impulse to have power over life, the controlling impulse. For me, this occurred in how I bowled. And having dyspraxia, this, it also impacts physical movement, including balance and coordination. We're sitting on the train tracks of um, intersectionality. My body was viewed, was seen as not only on the outside of normative whiteness, but also because of physical differences in how I moved implying the existence of a system that not only privileges, privileges whites, but is run by whites for white benefit. But even in the realm of disability, uh, there was a standardized perception of, dif of perception of what was normal. Retelling, retelling old histories and playing the game on my intersection, my intersectionality was policed with the fact that white was synonymous with healthiness and being raced as white. My vessel is not just a black body, it, is a, it could be interpreted as a black disabled body. And as George Yancey writes, body aesthetics when theorized through racist historical sentimentation of the white gaze can yield insight into processes of racialized balance that have deep social implications. In this statement, I've come to know that through the varied white gazes of the English establishment, I was seen as deficient three times over, as a black male, as working class, as neurodivergent slash disabled. This triple threat meant moving while black in white spaces brought this feeling of white people as terrorists as my ancestors did. Being invited to stow meant to a degree that the sector had turned a corner, whilst reminding me of the whiteness that, helped, that showed me how to talk in a mode white institutions would accept from a black man. The fact I hailed or came from the home counties and not say Litchfield, Perry Bar or Handsworth, like my paternal family in Birmingham, where certain accents and dialects would be racialized as too black and also is also part of my whiteness and privilege. Stowe also reminded me of my English heritage and as a writer and a poet, I also know that large portions of my work have only been accepted because of the standardised social etiquettes of behaviour I have adopted over time. Growing up as I did around Caribbeans that loved cricket, but then also going to school with the English middle upper classes, I soon saw how especially test cricket is a game of binaries, bat, bat, bat versus ball spin versus pace, sun versus rain, even down to who was playing, it can be as simple as white versus non-white, with the image of the really homogenous white nation fantasy, remember Had, Hadje, in England, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, uncoincidentally, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand, um, also being countries that were settler colony states, which whenever I have watched them have always been predominantly white teams in relation to the blackness and brownness of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, the West Indies, Zimbabwe and Sri Lanka. Skilled Berry has written about lots of cricket over the years, writing for the Daily Tele Telegraph, Tele 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 the Daily Telegraph, um, take from that what you will. Um, he wrote an article called Why England Would Be Better with more state school players in it. And he discussed how cricket has become too samey, too comfortable. In essence, what Bell Hooks described as the myth of sameness, leading to a homogeneity culture. 
that we see in most workspaces and that and that group think existed on and off the field this guardian article in the slides here by james wallace writes that a lot of the counties now direct a lot of these young players to the private schools with Surrey, Rory Burns, Jason Roy and Dom Sibley all went to Whitgift, an independent school in Croydon. It is possible they get directed in that way. End quote. The Wisdom Cricketer is a sound place to see what's what in cricket. And then you'll see of the 462 cricketers that they list, um, around 150 went to private school and 126 went to school abroad. Basically, 45% of the men employed to play cricket at county level in who were educated in the UK went to fee paying schools. And that is in relation to the 7%, so 7% of the population as a whole that attend private schools. The Sutton Trust and Social Mobility Commission report, Elitist Britain 2019, found that men's cricket in England was biased towards those that have a private education. The England team at the time had a 43% fee paying makeup. In 2020, so a 43% fee, a fee paying school makeup. In 2020, the men's team seems to be taking talent from an even more exclusive selection of people. The England Cricket Board, their so-called diversity strategy between 2020 and 2024 is called Inspiring Generations and one of its goals is to reach new audiences through these exclusive teams. It doesn't sound too dissimilar to that of a lot of institutions across different sectors in the, in the UK trying to include the historically excluded. It's challenging really when the team already is not representative of the country we live in today. England's 55 person training squad selected in the summer of last year had 26 from private schools, five of those 26 from overseas and 24 educated by the mainstream state system. Lots of these players are often the best for the job from the exclusive network that they choose from. But this is not about me and you and individualising achievement. In their book, Engines of Privilege, Britain's Private School Problem, historian David Kenyanston and economist Francis Green, both privately educated, discuss how private schools are the responsibility of society as a whole. James Wallace continues to discuss how this is more, this is greater than a private versus state fight. There is more nuance, including the scholarship system, private schools handpick state school children who are then fed into county cricket. Whilst this is positive on the surface, I think this still plays into the fact that a state, that a state child still must pander to the private school system to up their chances of playing for county. In big cities with green spaces dwindling, especially in the face of gentrification, there may come a time when cricket really becomes a countryside sport. And we know the challenges of access in the country already for people of colour. Whilst charities chance to shine, funded by the ECB, the England Cricket Board, and Sport England, um, in part, actually, in part funded by the ECB and the Sport England, run street cricket, it should not have to be that way. All over England, at least, state schools essentially sell their own assets to cope with budget cuts and years of austerity. austerity. Since 2010, James Wallace states that the government's website says that 215 playing fields have been sold in England, a harrowing statistic that could in fact be a contributing factor to the, to the 20, 2016 NHS figures citing one in three children in year six um, is either obese or overweight, with 225% in deprived areas compared to 12% in less deprived, more such more affluent areas. In doing that, you then start asking questions about things like food poverty, access to nutritious foods, who is using food banks, why are they using food banks? So statistics only give you an overview, but I won't get into that now.
will be will be here for a long while if I did. In summary, if you are a child at school in Britain today, without playing fields, and you don't live near a cricket club or don't have relatives with an interest, you're less likely or more than likely never to play cricket, coupled with other social factors. The first school I attended when I moved from London to Northampton was Overston Park in a village in West Northamptonshire. Great Houghton Prep was also in a village in West Northamptonshire. Wellingborough School is in Wellingborough Town in North Northamptonshire. All had their own private fields. Overstone and Great Houghton still have their own clubs, um, so local clubs that the public can use. Um, and you pay, you pay your subs, subscription fees for the summer and whatever. Wellingborough also does this as well, which I think might be played at the school. However, from anything I've spoken about um, today, cricket in Britain specifically is still a privileged sport that would attract white privileged people with money because one, it is embedded in the culture of private schools, both now and historically speaking. And two, kit is still expensive. Even with shopping economically, this summer I spent £500 to get kit kitted out this season. Working class parents, for sure, may not have that disposable income. And for the third reason, with David Harewood's 2016 statistic from his documentary, white people in this country are four times more likely to come from wealthy households than their black colleagues. And that was 2016. That statistic's already greater now, with disparities widening due to the coronavirus pandemic. Cricket is still an old boys club, sort of, and only because of the schools I went to was I motivated to actually take part in the game. It taught me a lot about white institutions and really white people. And I've carried that in how I function, including my work as a creative writer, a journalist, and generally someone that loves to do work in his community, currently co-running a local black public history project. Cricket may be an old boys club, but it also isn't at the same time. It slips about, I think, because of those of us who grew up under parents and grandparents from the West Indies, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and possibly even white English people who they themselves played cricket did not all come from moneyed backgrounds. I'm talking about people that had an interest and played with their mates when they were kids, but not, but not at club level. T today, I talk to my black British colleagues, my age of Caribbean heritage, who complain how obsessed with cricket their grandparents are, people from working class backgrounds. As children, not all my grandparents' generation played in the field, they played on the streets with whatever they could get their hands on. Even myself, despite the background I come from, I think my generation uh, might be the last generation to know what it's like to play out on the street and feel safe. I remember playing cricket on the street in Northampton during the holidays in the mid noughties My grandfather grew up in Grenada, um, coming to this country when he was 16, but he grew up playing cricket on the beaches. The Caribbean in particular is a site of cricket's false allegiances, where the West Indies took the English game and flipped it on its head. In England, the working class did the same thing with football. Why can't it happen again with cricket now in 2021 in this country? Yes, institutions are widening the gap, but there is an everlasting relevance for community organising. People have done, have, done, have done this with all sorts of things to combat in inequalities, resisting the violence perpetuated by the state. So why can't we do the same with cricket? In a Facebook post commenting on a recent article on Paul Gilroy, Dr. Kerry Sinanen wrote that this is such an important piece, the article. Paul Gilroy's work has been at the very foundations of my own since I was an undergraduate, as has the work of Stuart Hall, CLR James, Deborah McDowell and Sylvia Winter and others. Sinanen's positionality in their statement comes from someone that is both East Indian Trinidadian and has Irish, and Irish ancestry as well, through her parents and has grown up, has grown up in two colonised nations. nations. She goes on to say, I think it's because the Caribbean perspective is more disruptive of race than others. Its fabrications, its false allegiances are more clear. And this resists more essentialist arguments. While there is so much that is 
depressing in this long read. I take heart from the invocation of humanism that will eventually dissolve race whenever our attachments to place and culture, and that only does and that only does this dismantling from below, from the margins where we stand inscribed but challenging our oppressors. It is in this way that we need black and brownness. Quite a face, quite a thoughtful Facebook post actually. So, as Rene, Rene Edelodge says that when I write as an outsider, I'm also an insider in so many ways. I'm university educated, able-bodied, and I speak and write in ways very similar to those I criticise. I walk and talk like them, and part of that is why I'm taken seriously, as I write about shattering perspectives and disrupting objectivity. I have to remember that there are factors in my life that bolster my voice above others. And I take solace in that, that even though I'm a black person, I went to university and I write in ways that, in the same ways that of those I criticise at the same time. So I've picked up behaviours and social etiquettes from, from the institutions I've come through, very much so private school, in how I talk and, and how I carry myself and how I write. Um, and in some cases, how I dress at the same time. So, in conclusion, school gave me the tools I use now. I exist as an outsider, but I'm also an insider because of the private school networks I've passed through, a fly on the wall in white consciousness. My vernacular of speech and also my surname tells them, the establishment, I am one of them, but my skin color marks me as an outsider, as I write and work as a blogger, as a writer, as a journalist, even as a community worker, storifying racism and inequalities, whiteness and others, coming from a system that factors into why institutions choose to elevate my voice because they may see whiteness beyond a racial descriptor. It is a strange feeling, this double consciousness, one ever feels is two-ness a white, a black, an Englishman, a West Indian, working class, middle class. Like cricket, my life has been a game of binaries and I am an, I am an anomaly, an anomaly even unto myself. Thank you very much for watching. Um, and I'll leave you here with some further text that you might find interesting as well. So the first one there is about the West Indies tour of South Africa during the 1980s. They called it a rebel tour because some West Indies players went against the worldwide boycott of South Africa's apartheid regime to play in South Africa. The second is a film on the rise of West Indies cricket in the 1970s and 80s. Then you've got Paul Gilroy's book, Black Atlantic. And then you've got Michael Holdings, new book, Why We Knew, How We Rise. Uh, then James, C.L.R. James's book, Beyond the Boundary, which is on class, cricket and colonialism. And then below, you've got two Sky Sports uh, videos about racism and the Black Lives Matter struggle and that sort of thing, featuring Michael Holding and England women's cricket veteran, um, Ebony Rainford Brent as well. But yeah, uh, thanks very much for watching and have a good rest of your day or, or evening or whatever. Thank you.